St. John's. Hello and welcome to Sharing Our Cultures. This is the place where you get to meet amazing individuals from diverse cultural backgrounds who are making significant contributions to the social, cultural and economic development of Newfoundland and Labrador. Joining me today are Ricky and Joy De La Cruz, owners of RJ Pinoy Yom Restaurant, and Dr. Paul Banahini Ajay, Interim Associate Dean Program and Research at the School of Social Work at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Welcome back to Sharing Our Cultures. Joining me now are Ricky and Joy De La Cruz, owners of RJ Pino Young. Hello and welcome. Hi. How Hi. are you doing? We're I'm doing good. good so. Yes, good. Okay, so yes. how has the restaurant been doing since COVID-19? Um, right now, we're getting more busier compared to before because of the skip the dishes, that delivery that we have, and that kicks us our sales this time, and pretty good so far. Okay. It gets more mm. busier this time. Okay, that's great. It's good to know that mm. as well. Yeah. So, um, I know you've been thinking about starting a restaurant for a while, but why did you actually decide to do it? Um, we are planning, that we, it's almost five years now, mm -hmm. this November, since when we opened. And it's Ricky's decision during <laughs> the time. It's, that's his passion anyway. So I'm supporting him, mm -hmm. <laughs> able for us to came up with this, you know, success in our mm -hmm. yeah, small start, business. I start to do some uh, catering and some order tray. And yeah, then I decided to uh, put the... Uh, uh, Filipino restaurant, restaurant. Yeah. So, yeah. so I came up to RJ Pinoy um, restaurant yeah. and we shared the food of our culture. Okay. Yeah, especially we are, you know, there's no Filipino restaurant here since 1970s or 60s, right. 60s again. And during the time and it's our, we, we made our, we cater our food to the sharing cultures as well, multicultural events, so, mm -hmm. and until we came up to offer some, you know, some space that we can do some right. restaurant business in the, here in St. John, especially to keep our Filipino community to stay as well. <laughs> right, yes, yeah. So, um, and of course, your restaurant is employing people here. Yes. How yeah. many employees do you have now? Uh, right now, um, we have our own family. It's mm -hmm. a family business this time, and mm -hmm. we employed some uh, yeah, part-timer because yeah. they have their full-time job, and they, it's come and go for them. Okay. So, yes. so we decided, and the immigration, you know, we applied mm -hmm. for the immigration uh, provincial nominee, and okay. we were, were granted last year. Yeah. So it's a big help for us that, you know, we keep our family as well, mm -hmm. working with us, especially with this time of the year. That's right, yes. And I think many people who come really appreciate you and yes. uh, the help that you've given to them you know, over the years. Yes, that's but, right. um, So you are newcomers from the Philippines, would say. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the challenges that you face here, either living here or with the restaurant? Yeah, um, it's been a long year now for me to mm -hmm. be here and that time it's hard anyway, especially I don't have any family here. Mm -hmm. So kind of, you know, being in the multicultural events during the time and mm -hmm. multicultural women's mm -hmm. uh, affiliation. So I joined different kind of um, activities as well mm -hmm. in Ipo for us to, you know, subside our homesickness <laughs> and mm -hmm. until you know, and same with Ricky as well. Mm -hmm. So okay. we join our Filipino community, some functions and, you right. know, those kind of yeah. thing. And until oh. the, we came up with the RJ Pinoyam restaurant mm -hmm. business. So 
it helped us, the churches as well, to support us, us anyway, mm -hmm. and friends, mm -hmm. the one that uh, keep us uh, <laughs> moving on with our journey from the business. Yeah. And it is a successful business, not only for people from the Philippines, but yeah. also local people, local, you know, yes. really um, enjoy the food. I know I do. Yeah. I <laughs> yes, and mm. people are, they thought that they were close already and, and they were happy that we brought the Filipino food mm -hmm. here in right. St. John's, okay. the one who, who came up to live in mainland. So now that they moved here and they're happy that we have a Filipino restaurant as well. It's more diverse uh, community here now in St. Right. John's that they have different food that they can mm -hmm. experience again. <laughs> right, yes. So Ricky, what is the, your favorite food that you prepare? Well, it's, uh, okay. I love to uh, do our traditional food. Uh, okay. Chicken adobo and, uh, and uh, beef curry curry cook for the cooking a uh, peanut sauce and we have a uh, wonton nachos that's the famous one okay and then the taco chicken taco or mm -hmm. fish taco and then the steam bun mm -hmm. uh, that's the one famous here the pork pork yeah, the pork, pork steam bun right yeah. yeah i can see the joy on your face when you're yeah. saying it because i know oh, you're the chef every time i see the customers they smiling a powerful I have more energy to cook. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, Get yes. Yeah. Uh, and I, sh I should tell everyone that you make the best hot pepper sauce <laughs> in the whole oh. province. Well, I, I, I yeah. want to say it's in the whole world, because, yeah. uh, but I haven't been to every part of the world. But for yeah. everywhere else I've been, that hot pepper sauce, yeah. you should um, uh, this really... Uh, yeah. This uh, homemade, really uh, homemade hot yeah. sauce. Yeah. Uh, they really Every. want us to put it in a bottle so they can, I said, it's only for IJ. <laughs> and it's another preparation for him if yes. he can make it another, mm -hmm. you know, to sell it to someone else. So. Right, yes. It'll be coming soon. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it'll be coming soon. I think it is. And I'll, I'll make sure that I uh, get uh, regular yes, orders sir. from you because I, mm -hmm. um, I really enjoy, really enjoy that as well. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So um, I was just thinking if you have other people either from the Philippines or other parts of the world who want to come here and start a business, what would you advise them? What are some of the little tips you'll give them of what they need to know to do that? Yeah, for, for us, um, because we are a couple, so I think that's the best thing to and have some faith. Mm -hmm. And for us, that's the best thing that, you know, your passion and patience, mm -hmm. you know, those kind of um, ability that you can join together in able for you to, you know, mm -hmm. because first year you will encounter a lot of difficulties, especially from our situation during the time. We thought we're not going to make it mm -hmm. because we started in November and it's more snowing time during the time and until it came up that, you know, people, word of mouth, you know, mm -hmm. that will help us to generate our business it's, as well. It's a lot of trials, you know, to put mm -hmm. up business, mm -hmm. uh, but just keep going. And yeah. Just, uh, you, you will pass the trials, everything. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You just persevered. Yeah, so. supporting each other, and mm -hmm. that's a, like yeah. the one that we, we usually have as right. a business <laughs> and as a couple yeah. owner right yeah. yeah yeah no I think that's uh, important because you're the chef of course but yeah. uh, you've supported him mm -hmm. all, all through all getting through. it started you're doing it actually together as a couple yeah. as you say so that makes it a lot easier for people if they have to s start a business that they mm -hmm. kind of do it together with someone else yeah mm -hmm. right that's and right. Uh, that when you go through some of those challenges it will we will help you right. Sure. Yeah. So what were some of the difficulties, Ricky, for you in getting this started? I know if you were having a restaurant in the Philippines, probably the rules and regulations would be a bit different. But mm -hmm. what was it uh, here for you that maybe was a little bit difficult? Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's, uh, it's not a big difficult, but it's a challenge to uh, sometimes the weather. Yeah. Uh, it was really challenged sometimes. Uh, if, uh, the weather is like a worse and then you need to close your restaurant. Mm -hmm. in, in the Philippines, it's all day. <laughs> it's, uh, 
open a restaurant. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So but mainly the weather. Yeah. 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 Weather well. and another thing is for our supplier as well, okay. right? Yeah. right? Sometimes they don't have any stock of what we looking mm -hmm. for. Right. So so we have to wait for another week in April oh. for us to keep that <laughs> yes. that supply that we really need, like the pork belly that mm -hmm. famous here anyway, okay. so and they usually we waited sometimes because it's out of stock, so they get from their supplier as well. Mm -hmm. So those yeah. kind of things. So what do you do then when you, the suppliers don't bring in what you need, the mm -hmm. ingredients you need, but then you have it on your menu that you're going to serve it. So yeah. what, what do you do? How do you get over that? No, we need to put uh, out of stock. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, okay. So yeah. need to yeah, yeah okay. we put it as just like, you know, temporarily, okay. temporarily out of stock yeah. okay. well, until we, mostly, so we usually tell our yeah. uh, customers. Mostly that this kind of uh, pandemic yeah. is uh, really hard to get some uh, uh, supplies, mm -hmm. yeah. as sometimes the, the shipping, day, sometimes the, ship. it's the tracking problems, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. right. It's really hard to get in the mainland mm -hmm. to ship here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So main, your, most of the ingredients that you use yeah. come from the mainland? I use the yeah. ingredients in local. 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 Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's really hard to get some uh, uh, traditional vegetable in the Philippines here. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I use uh, the local vegetable here. Yeah, but this is easy to get. Mm -hmm. And they support the local business here too. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so we idea. force ourselves to go mm -hmm. to the local in April for us to keep our food in the restaurant to yes. keep running. Right. right? So yeah. if the supplier is not there, so we support, you know, we go out to mm -hmm. the local businesses as well on the groceries. Right. Yeah. So is, um, is there a way in which you can maybe modify the recipe a bit by um, using more local or will the f people from the Philippines tell, hmm, this does not quite taste yeah. like what we have back yeah. home? Yeah, some, some quite different. When, when I start the menu, I, I think about that, uh, those supplies. Yeah. That's why I turn a little bit uh, different, but still the taste of the Philippines is still there. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. yes, yeah. Because mm -hmm. you have the spices, I guess. Yeah. It's yes. just yeah. spices. You have the same spices. The spices is still here, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Well, uh, <coughs> uh, what are you looking forward to in the future for this restaurant? You're going to open another one, you think? That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. After mm -hmm. this uh, pandemic, maybe. Right. Uh, Try to Bigger open another one. one. Little, okay. uh, if God's will. <laughs> it's yes. willing if we can open it a bigger space yes. that we can accommodate it, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Because sometimes we we usually close or we didn't mm -hmm. get our some of our customers were, you know, in their lineup there and mm -hmm. It's our frustration if they were running out right, the, yeah. Yeah, with the state with the chairs or tables. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I really wish you success, maybe more algae yeah. pinoy yums around the whole province. And uh, I'll be sure you'll be, I'll be one of the first ones to be there. <laughs> and uh, I really do appreciate the fact that you're in our community it makes it so much richer mm -hmm. for us. Yeah, so thank, thank you very you so much. much as well thank for you. Thank you. All right. Welcome back to Share in Our Cultures. I have with me today Dr. Paul Banahini Ajay, Associate Professor of the School of Social Work at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Welcome, <laughs> Dr. Thank Ajay. Thank you very much. How are you doing? Uh, not as good as you, but I'm doing very well. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Well, I was actually thinking that um, your research area uh, is in black parenting and the child care system. Now, what are some of the pertinent findings of your research in that area? Thank you very much. How do I put it? Uh, uh, you know, the nature of black parenting, is, you know, to borrow the words of, uh, uh, you know, Indian scholar Spivak, you know, Gayatri, uh, it is the unavoidable 
usefulness of something that is equally dangerous. Um, take recent incident of you know, the murder of you know, uh, Mr. You know, George Floyd. Uh, for many black parents who were watching uh, that video, what was going through their mind is, how do I ensure that what happened to Floyd does not happen to my children? So in many ways, the manner in which black parents raise their children in Canada here is try as much as possible to teach them about how to interact with you know, uh, people in authority, in particular police officers. And so in many ways, they tend to the, the very nature of the house arrangement or the way in which they leave the house as a, a sort of you know, role play mm -hmm. with the parenting figures being the, the individual in authority and the children are supposed to be you know, complying. So if children in many ways you know, conduct themselves in a way that tend to challenge the authority of the parents. You know, parents understood that to mean that, well, I'm setting you up to fail because the way you are talking back to me and the way you are challenging me in the house, this is what you are going to do when you go out mm -hmm. on the street. And I don't want to be called either to, you know, bail you out from prison or, you know, to identify your body at the mob. And so whatever I need to ensure that you learn to respect those in authority I'm going to do in this household. Mm -hmm. And sometimes this brings a sort of tension between them and, and the child welfare system. The, I also realize that in many cases, uh, language become a problem. And when I say language, language of you know, interpretation and understanding the intent of the way in which black parents are raising their children. So for instance, the word spanking is not in any yeah. you know, uh, lexicon of any uh, African language. Mm -hmm. And so when, rather than the parents using spanking, they use the word beat. Right. So yeah. when, when child welfare officers you know, show mm -hmm. up yeah. and they say that, well, I beat my child, Beating is definitely an assault, mm -hmm. and that automatically gets the parents into trouble. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, um, uh, some of the child welfare parents, uh, the child welfare officers, don't understand mm -hmm. the language. And so, for instance, you know, uh, a typical black parent will say that, you know, you better not come to the house because mm -hmm. I'm going to kill you. Right. Of course, they don't mean that they are going to literally yeah. kill their mm -hmm. child. It's, it's one way of using, using, you know, using those you know, words as to let the child know that what they've done you know, is wrong. Uh, I also realized that in the studies that many parents come into Canada not familiar with the child protection laws mm -hmm. and the regulation you know, regarding parenting. And sometimes they don't even know the existence of those laws. And it is, they only become aware of that after they have been caught breaking it. Right, so right. that become a challenge. I mean, one example you know, is issues around uh, supervision. Mm -hmm. For instance, in many parts of Africa, it takes the village to raise a child. Right. So the notion that the absence of the primary giver in this particular case, uh, mm -hmm. either the mother of the or the father, mm -hmm. the, their absence it does not necessarily mean that the child you know, lacks supervision. Right. Because in many cases, mm -hmm. there are other people within the community that takes part mm -hmm. in, the, in raising the child. And, and when they come into new society as immigrants, uh, sometimes they forget that they are in a new environment mm -hmm. and get caught up in moments where they get accused of no, no supervising. In, in, in many cases, is the area of no uh, child neglect. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is not to suggest that all issues re regarding black parenting is, is mm -hmm. acceptable. I mean, there have been cases of excesses. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, you know, black parents have a genuine intent and mm -hmm. rationale for doing what they do when it comes to raising their children. And I will just you know, give you one example and end this conversation. Uh, there, there was one particular immigrant mother who shared her stories about having spent uh, three days, three nights, you know, running away, drawing a war zone, carrying her, you know, her son at her back, you know, and crawling on the ground in the night 
and in the day ensuring that she bring her son to a place of safety. And after three days and three nights, she finally managed to get to refugee camp and through that process they came to Canada. Mm -hmm. And an incident happened in the house and in the process she spanked her child. And she felt insulted when the child welfare officer was questioning mm -hmm. you know, her sense of parenting love mm -hmm. and said that, well, you never know what I've done to protect mm -hmm. myself, so don't question my love. Mm -hmm. And so these are some of the issues mm -hmm. that emerge in the studies. Right. Yeah. And of course, it's difficult when people come here from other parts of the world, they don't leave their culture behind, or when they arrive at the airport, it's very much a part of them. <laughs> yeah, that's their frame of reference. <laughs> exactly. I mean, <laughs> nobody, you know, leave their culture behind. It comes with them, yeah. and it's in, in form. And in fact, studies have shown that mm -hmm. Uh, for the, the first generation, second generation, mm -hmm. it takes years for them to, you know, and sometimes it doesn't even happen at all to mm -hmm. adjust to the culture of their, their host country. And so, and, but for the children, they learn it quickly. They, they are able to adjust mm -hmm. and become used to the culture of their host country. Mm -hmm. And that itself also brings tension. Mm -hmm. So for instance, here, the culture of sleepover is very common mm -hmm. and acceptable. But for many immigrants' parents, uh, the, the culture of their child leaving their house mm -hmm. to go and sleep over with their friends is something that it, they are not familiar with right. and also brings a sort of tension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's always that intergenerational conflict too when the children learn English quicker than the parents and yes. uh, then the, <laughs> the parents then can't communicate, you know, with the children or with their teachers or couldn't go to parent-teacher meetings, you know, things like that. So that does uh, yeah. create some, some issues as well. It, it yeah. does. And, and one interesting findings in our study, when one incident where a child went to school mm -hmm. and because of the behavior the child was conducting, the, the principal wrote a letter, you know, you know uh, telling the, the child's parent about the, the negative attitude of, of the child, you know, in the school. Mm -hmm. Of course, the parents don't understand English. It's the same child who is supposed to read the letter. <laughs> and the child went and explained the letter to the parents that, well, the principal says, I'm really doing very well and should be rewarded in the house. <laughs> when actually, uh, yes. in the content of the letter, right. it was, re you know, uh, reprimanding the child and right. explaining yeah. to the parents, you know, mm. uh, the negative uh, behavior of the right. child in the yeah. school. So right. these are some of the examples mm. right. where languages have become a, a barrier right. in, in the way in which the parents, you know, raise their children in this mm -hmm. country. Right, yeah. Well, now you're the Associate Professor for the School of Social Work, um, and you are training social workers, or maybe social workers also take some of your courses. So how yes. important is it for social workers to actually know about the cultures of the clients that they're dealing with? I, I mean, uh, the, the understanding the culture of client is not negotiable. It is very important because social work profession is about relationship, you know, understanding uh, the behavior of your client. And if you don't understand the culture and, and what inform how your clients, you know, uh, engage you know, and interact, mm -hmm. uh, that is going to be very difficult to be able to relate to them. And, and sometimes the notion of understanding your client is not necessary to uh, accept or justify what they are doing, mm -hmm. but try to understand the mindset. But also very important to this conversation around culture is for the social worker also to be aware that they are not also neutral to culture. The social worker themselves constitute a form of culture. And in Canadian society here, there, 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 there is a you know, European uh, uh, culture that seems to be very hegemonic. And in most cases, it's taken for granted. Because in many cases, social workers have an understanding of how society is supposed to behave and how in social relationship is supposed to uh, appear. But this knowledge that inform the social workers' understanding are not neutral to their own culture. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that there is an unconscious, unconscious biases mm -hmm. that comes with culture. Mm -hmm. And that until the social worker themselves also understand that they constituted a particular form of culture, and those culture in many ways guide their understanding of what they see as right and wrong. 
And it is important that they become aware of that mm -hmm. and also become aware of the unique cultural conditions and background of the, the immigrants' parents they are interacting with. The central question maybe we all need to ask ourselves is, mm -hmm. can culture be a universal? No, it is not. Every society and community have their own form of culture that inform how they, they interact and relate to people. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand that when immigrants come here, they are not just coming as empty bodies. They are coming with a particular culture. And we need to be familiar with those cultures before we can uh, fully relate to them. Yeah, that's really important because, um, of course, as you've mentioned earlier, there's so many difficulties that come in and misunderstandings and you know, the language barriers as well that also play a role in the in communication, intercultural communication between social workers, actually it, not only social workers, but in every phase of whether it's healthcare or whether it's law enforcement, like they all play a role in how they interact with newcomers. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, let's even give one perfect example of the, the importance of culture and when it comes to food. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, over here we have a general understanding of what we consider to be uh, nutritious food. There's a lot of information that you've shared with us that's very important for us to hear today and we really do appreciate your being here with us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Join us next time on Sharing Our Cultures as we share the contributions that individuals from around the world have made to this place they now call home. Convenience Marie's Money Mart is here for you. A one-stop shop for a variety of products, homestyle breads, sandwiches, plus check out our freshly baked artisan breads and single-serve desserts exclusively at our in-store bakery on Frecker Drive. With 25 locations, wherever you go, there we are. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. I don't fit in the world. Is it possible the world still needs you? All in her head. It's real to her. Don't you tell me what's real. He's using my daughter to get to me. I need you and your team on this one. We do it my way. No questions asked. Come out, come out wherever you are. It's about sharing and caring.